Greetings and blessings to each of you today. It is a tremendous blessing to be here with you. Um, I'm enjoying Ireland and uh, enjoying getting to know some of you. I've heard some interesting stories here, and I just want to bless each of you in your pursuit after God. This morning, for a little, we're going to look at a question having to do with the good life. And that is a phrase that we hear in, in America anyway, is what is the good life? I want to back up just a little and look at our own personal lives, a little self-examination. Um, you know, we're living in a, in a rapidly changing world, and we're all aware of that. If you, if you read the news today, uh, you understand that our world is changing rapidly. And one of the areas it's changing in is the area of relationships and marriage and what does marriage even mean? What does it mean to be married? And, and can you marry something besides a person? Uh, there's all kinds of theories out there now on, on marrying animals. And uh, there's even, I read about just recently, uh, holographic images in Japan. There's a company called Gatebox that has established a holographic image you can create on your own. And you can marry that image. So you can, you can marry a, a, an AI uh, representation and create it however you want. So the question that we're going to start out with this morning is simply this. What does it mean to be human? What does that mean to us today? Or another way we could ask that is, what is unique about humanity? Now, we can think about, well, humans have a soul. But Beyond that, in what observable way are humans actually different from other mammals? And men have wrestled with this for, for generations. You know, René Descartes, 1600 French philosopher, is a foundational thinker in, in Western notions of reason and science. And he came up with the saying that I think, therefore I am. So is advanced intellect, is that what makes us human? Is that our most unique characteristic is simply the fact that we can think great thoughts? Or sometimes in Christianity, when we talk about beliefs, what you believe. Is that what makes us different? Is our ability to believe something? I hold important beliefs. Are we primarily believers? Is that what we are as humans? Is that what makes us unique? Is that ability to think and believe correct things? Or I do important things. It's like I've lost my... Are we primarily doers? get back here in just a minute, hopefully. Let's try it again. There it goes. We'll try it again. So is the fact that we, we simply do important things. There's no other creature we know in, on earth that's done more than humanity has. You can look at buildings. You can look at all the things that men have developed. Is that what makes us unique? So make us special because we do amazing things. I want to propose that humans are actually more than thinkers, believers, or doers. All these distinctions are very true. But the Bible indicates there's something else about man that makes us very, very unique. It separates us very distinctly from other mammals. It's simply this. Created in the image of God, humans are lovers. All of us love. God is love. His very nature is love. That's who he is. We've been created in his image, and therefore, all of us love. As humans, we have loves. It's part of the inerrant, uh, part of who we are. It's just simply the fact that we love. And every love has an object or an aim. There's always something that love is aimed at. So humans engage at a heart level, not just with minds thinking or hands doing. Uh, and even though love is is not something we see, it's something that's very, very strong. It moves people to do things they would not ordinarily do, simply because they love. What we love, desire, 
and worship defines who we are. Even as humans, what we love really defines that. And the Bible says this in different ways. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The NIV says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So what you love down inside you, your deep loves, actually have a huge impact on who you are as a person. They're going to impact what you're doing and where you're going. Now, I mentioned earlier that love has an aim. Loves and longings have some kind of target they're aimed at always. For love to even exist, there has to be a target. There has to be an aim for it. And so for centuries, philosophers have wrestled with this. Men who were not Christians understood this. There's something inside of us that gives us purpose for living. There's something that gets us out of bed in the morning. There's something that makes us move forward, that motivates us. So think about just for a little bit your target, the aim of your life, your focus, the focus of your loves. Now, you may not realize it, but it is aimed at something. We don't often stop and think about this, but our loves are aimed at something. Cicero, Rome's famous orator, called it the summum bonum, the highest good. That was the target. He, just, he tried to think about and, and analyze what is it that we as humans are, are aiming at. And it's actually what we think of as the highest good. It may not be what your neighbor thinks is the highest good, but each of us have one. And so to each person, he was saying, their summum bonum is that. It's the highest good. It's what they're, they're, aim, they're aiming at with their loves. Aristotle called this our telos. We're going to use this word a little bit today. It is the final cause, the ultimate aim or object of life. It is what you are aimed at, focused at. And in America, we call it the good life. So just for a little bit, I want you to think about what is the good life to you? When you think about the good life, when that, that phrase comes to your mind, what is it you visualize? And try to think of it as a picture, not just a list of, of, of words or bullet points, but think about a picture when you visualize the good life. What is that? Now, I want to propose that your telos, the thing you are aimed at, is simply a, a visualization of whatever that is in your life. And we'll get into that in just a minute. So what is the good life? You know, I have, I have a neighbor right now, lives across the road from us. And this picture I'm going to give you, I think, illustrates his telos. It's simply a beach. It's no responsibilities. It's a place he can go and just sit and drink and uh, have good food and nobody's bothering him. And he gets home from one vacation and he takes off and he goes on another one. They just go round and round, one vacation after another. He's worked hard all of his life. In his mind, this is the picture of the good life. Now, some of you here, especially the men, that probably looks a little boring to you. I can do that for about a day or half a day, but at the end of that, I'm ready to get, get on with life. That's... I just can't sit there. And I would struggle more with this. Just increase production. I, I love production. I like to get things done. To me, a good day is to have a list with eight things on it and get ten things done. That, that's a good day. That's, it's just production. Maybe that's part of you and your telos, what you're aiming at, what you think of about success. Increase production. Maybe it's just simply you wouldn't want to admit it, but just having the money to do what you want to do. Maybe in your mind you visualize, if I just had enough money to actually do what I want to do, that would really be something. That's my telos. Or maybe it's family, just having a good family, children who respect and appreciate you, uh, children who are loving the Lord, who are being faithful. Um, but in reality, for most of us, our telos is not one picture. It's a composite of many pictures, of several pictures. But try to visualize in your mind, just be honest with yourself, what is it in your life you are actually aiming at? What is your telos? The fact is, we cheerfully sacrifice for the object of our worship, whatever that is. Whatever it is we are aiming at, it's like I lost it again. We will, we will sacrifice whatever to get there. We will actually do that.
I was at a meeting one time where we talked about what to deal with technological failure. And one man said, just have them sing a song. And another one said, I've went through a whole book before doing that. So sometimes it takes a while. Chances my computer. Is it chances my computer? Do you want to swap computers? If you, if you have it on the flash drive, that would help. Yeah. Like I can put it on one. Yeah. Swap it over. Yeah. It's up again, but it's probably going to crash again. Oh. Let's keep going for a Okay. All right. Okay. We'll try to keep rolling here. So we willingly sacrifice whatever it is that you think of as your telos, whether you know it or not. You will sacrifice for that. Uh, we see men in corporations, for example, if, if, your, if your passion as a man is to be the CEO of a large corporation, men will sacrifice their families, they'll sacrifice everything to get to that point, whatever that telos is. And it isn't really hard to discover what our telos is because it is what our life pours into. You can think about the extra time you have. It's going to go toward your telos. You can think about your money, extra money. We call it discretionary money. It's extra it will tend to always go toward whatever that is in our life. Our abilities, our daily choices, all these things point toward the telos. They always point toward what we perceive to be the good life. Our thoughts, our loves, our desires, our longings, all of that tends to go in that direction. So even though we're not aware of this, that is where our passions go. But where does this telos come from? Where does our perception even of what the good life is, where do we get that? You know, there's many factors that determine uh, the good life, uh, that picture we have in our mind. But one of these is are simply our culture. Culture tends to shape telos. And this is formed at a very young age with children. They're picking up all the time what's important to them. They're picking up what's important to the, in the culture around them. And we're shaped both by external culture around us 
and by internal culture within our church communities, within the people we're with. Let's start a little bit with external. What we read, what we watch, what we listen to forms this telos. It forms the good life. It forms our perception of what success looks like. And our consumption of media really impacts what we view today as the good life. Electronic entertainment, it slowly and subtly shapes our values. Uh, movies in particular today, movies around our world are shaping you. They do it in a very subtle way, but they, they demonstrate, they teach you what's important, what's valuable. If you're always watching movies, for example, that teach you that wealth is a good thing, or that immorality is an exciting thing. All of that shapes what you view as important and valuable in your life. And without us realizing it, we gradually take on our culture's telos. That's very powerful in our lives. Advertising. Advertising encourages a materialistic telos. It's, it's designed to create discontent, dissatisfaction with life. And it's making us long for more, things that we don't have. If you just simply wear this, or drive this, or have this, or look in this certain way, you'll be successful. And all that subtly impacts us. Very powerful. Interaction with fellow workers, businessmen. This happens if you work in a job site with unbelievers, for example, and you're constantly listening to conversations you're going to develop a telos. You're going to develop a worldview or what the good life is from the inputs you receive from them. Again, it's very subtle, but we pick that up gradually. Now, Jesus intended that we interact. He did not intend that we isolate ourselves away from everyone else and live out here by ourselves. He actually wanted us to be in the world, but not of it. And so even though we are called to do that, it does impact us. It does change how we view life. And there's an inherent danger. If we're not constantly pushing back against the external culture, it will impact our lives. What about, though, the ways that our own lives, our own church communities impact the culture that we have within? How does it impact us? What about dinner table conversations? Who are the heroes? Who are the, the stories being told? What are we hearing from little up? All that tells us what's important, what's of value. You know, if you, if you grow up and your parents are always telling rags to riches stories of someone who started out, they were very, very poor, but they worked hard, they became successful, and that today they have lots of money. If that's what you hear growing up and that becomes your heroes, then you will believe that actually wealth is a good thing and being successful is connected to wealth. If you grew up uh, hearing about people who gave up riches to follow Jesus, it's going to be a different telos. You're going to see life differently. You're going to think of the good life as something very different. The songs we sing, they are extremely formative in developing, especially in youth. Don't underestimate the power of songs, of music. What we listen to, what we sing, all that helps shape this telos. It helps shape this thing in our heart, this picture we have of what the good life is. Don't underestimate the power of music in that. Religious liturgies mold our view of God and our position before Him. Our religious practices, just how we worship, tells a lot about who we think God is, who we believe we are. They form our view of Him. Now, you know, dress may not be very significant in your mind, but the fact is this, how you come to worship. If, it's a, if you dress formally or dress casually, it's going to impact how you think about God and how you think about your place before Him. I remember being one time in a church, I believe it was an Anglican church, and everyone stood to, to read the New Testament. Well, that impacts how you think about the New Testament. That, that type of, of worship actually impacts how you think about God and His Word. It's going to have an impact on that. The way we sing, what we sing, how we pray, the seriousness with which we read the Bible, all that has an impact on this telos inside of us. Um, 
Just think about growing up in a home that's, that's punctual getting to church versus one who isn't. That's going to impact the child's view of God and how important he is in their life. And all these little tiny things impact us in powerful ways, informing this telos in our mind. The comments, lifestyles of influential community heroes and leaders. This is, this is huge. What is said by people in a community, people who are viewed as influential, whether that's because they're leaders, they're business owners, whatever it is, what they say, the comments they make is very powerful. It shapes our own telos. You know, more than just forming our telos, our way of life actually reveals what that telos is. And it not only reveals it, it also strengthens that telos. It strengthens that, that picture within of the good life. Habits, practices reflect and reinforce telos. Daily routines both show and strengthen. They reveal what the good life is. You know, when I, we talk about human flourishing, that means different things to different people. And we will see what it means to you, and I'll see what it means to me as I look at my habits, my daily life. What do I repeatedly sacrifice for? What do I give up myself for? That's revealing what that telos is inside. It also strengthens. Have you ever noticed that children who are born on a dairy farm, who get up every morning at 4.30 and go out and, and, um, and take care of the cows repeatedly over and over again, Almost always throughout their life, they have an appreciation, kind of a love for dairy farms. Even though they may get off the farm, they'll carry that with them. There's something about repetition and routine that develops within us, something that's very, very powerful. It's more than just caring about cows. It's actually a love for the whole lifestyle that goes with it. This is true in, in, in any area. You find someone who practices soccer every day. They'll not only get better at soccer, they will learn to love that sport more. It'll be part of their good life. It's just part of it. People who grow up in high culture churches where there's a lot of liturgy, it can be very difficult for them to walk away from that because it becomes part of them. The standing up, the sitting down, the liturgy that's involved, all that becomes part of them. Our love grows for things that we engage in. When we engage in things repetitively, we tend to love that. That's also one of the reasons you'll find in the Old Testament there was a lot of feasts, repetitive things. They did over and over again. It's why in the church today in the New Testament we have communion. It causes us to love it. It's something we do repeatedly. We engage in it. It does impact that telos, that picture within now, we engage in what's called thick and thin culture. There's a book out there by James Smith called Desiring the Kingdom. Very interesting book. But he speaks of both thick and thin cultures. A thick culture is something that's very significant in our lives. It impacts our loves. A thin culture is one that doesn't. We'll look at both those real quickly here. You can think about thin practice. Thin practices are something that's aimed at something different than our telos. It's just routines. It can be brushing teeth. It can be doing things every day repeatedly, it doesn't actually impact our telos. It doesn't really change that. We call those thin practices. But there's thick practices that play a significant role in shaping our telos. Um, worship liturgies, shopping at malls, the use of technology. These are thick. Now, some of these you may think of shopping at a mall or shopping at a, a, um, a, big, a big department store might not really impact me. But there are some things that do that we don't think about. If in the evening you tend to sit down to relax and you pick up a catalog there that has sporting goods, that actually is a very formative thing in your telos. You keep doing that over and over again, it will actually change and create more of a love for sporting. Uh, you can think about financial things. If your tendency is in the evening to sit down and just read articles about finances, about people who are successful, about corporations that started out and have succeeded, you keep doing that over and over again, it will strengthen that love for finance. That's just how that telos is, is developed within us. Uh, electronic entertainment is something. Pulling up, pulling up something on your phone all the time and looking at it, it actually shapes and changes that inner 
tell us within us. And it does it in, in not only in wealth, uh, fashion, for example. It will create a picture in you of what a successful person actually looks like. It impacts us in that way. What pleasure is, what status means, what values are, all those things are shaped by these little inputs that happen over and over again, especially in thick culture. Now, our, our challenge is this, and a good part of this book is written to, about this. Our challenge is many of the things we think of as thin culture are actually thick. They're actually shaping us in ways that we don't understand. And so when you do something repeatedly, be aware there's a very good chance it's shaping that picture you have within of what is valuable, what the good life actually is. We develop ruts in our mind. Certain actions become automatic. Now, God made us in this way for a good reason, because there are things... Have you ever noticed if you drive a car, how you can drive for quite a ways and not even realize where you were at? Your mind was off on something else. It's because your mind has developed a pattern, a way of thinking of driving, of thinking about driving without being conscious of the fact you're driving. That's a good thing. It's, it's a way you can actually think about two different things at one time. But the problem is, is if these ruts in our mind are, are developed in wrong patterns, in wrong ways, it's very difficult to change that. Several years ago, we did some remodeling in our bathroom at our home, and and we changed things around in there. And where I normally go for my clothes, we moved that. And that's probably been two or three years ago that we did that. And still to this day, when I get out of the shower, if my mind's on something else, I'll go in the wrong direction to get my clothes. Because I have a pattern in my mind of where to go to get my clothes that's wrong now. It simply was shaped over time, repeatedly going to that cabinet that's wrong now. That's how our minds work. It, it's good, but can also be dangerous. Neuroscientists tell us it's because our brains form predictable pathways. We can brush our teeth, we can drive a car without giving much thought to that. And our telos then motivates our decisions. These choices become habits. And then these practices, especially the thick ones, strengthen that telos. So it goes around and around. So our, we're, we are developing our telos, and our tele, telos causes us to do certain things. We do that repeatedly, and that strengthens the telos. And that is simply why, once developed, it's very difficult to change our telos. Very difficult. Once you have a picture in your mind of what the good life is, it's very, very hard to change that. I remember years ago hearing somebody say that they've heard people who who make radical life changes. They know they're going this way in life, and, and suddenly they, they, maybe they're inspired by Scripture, by God moves in their lives, and they turn around and they start going the other way. But this person told me he'd never, ever seen someone over 50 years old do that. And the reason is, is because once that, that picture of the good life is established in there, it's very difficult to change that, very hard to change. Almost like cement. Our picture of the good life hardens, and it's very difficult for us to see something else. No wall is too high. Once we establish a telos in our life, once we establish the picture of the good life, we will find a way to get there. You know, this telos, the reason it's so serious, the reason that picture you have in your mind of the good life is so serious is we will find a way to get to it. When you have that established in your mind, when you have a picture in your mind of what the good life is, we will find a way to get there. We are extremely creative and persistent in our pursuit of telos. We can resist any argument. Uh, we, can, we can debate anything. We'll find flaws in rational logic even if we actually want to get there. We're very creative. We'll walk through a couple examples of that. We're very creative in getting there. Telos trumps logic and sound reasoning. Good logic, you can give me good logic, but it will not keep me from pursuing my telos. It won't. Brotherhood counsel, even if everyone else in my congregation disagrees with me, if in my mind I have a picture of the good life, I will be able to get around it somehow. I will find a way to get there. Clear scriptural instruction. 
even if there's direct biblical teaching, if I want to go after that picture, which I do, I will go after it. Let me give you a few examples here. You know, in America right now, um, we call it American nationalism. It's a connection between Christianity and American life. It's a, it's a pull between. If I, was, if I was raised in a Christian home and my picture of the good life is simply Christian nationalism, and I all my life I grew up both hearing about Christianity and about men who fought in the American uh, military, and, and I, I merged those two together, if that's my picture, then God and country to me is a beautiful thing. And that is my telos. I will, I will go after that because I perceive that to be a beautiful thing. And I can be reading my Bible someday and come across a verse like this. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. That's a pretty strong statement. And you would assume that anyone could read that statement and say, I need to stop. Something's wrong here. I'm going a wrong direction. But the fact is, in reality, I will find a way around that if my telos is still God and country. If I have a beautiful picture of God and country in my mind, I will find, I'll develop creative arguments, I'll find some way to get there if that is my telos. If I was a young woman, and this is a picture of the Christian lady who first shared the gospel with me, and that's my picture of Christianity, and if every stable Christian woman in my congregation looked about like this, if that was my picture in my mind of what stable, godly Christianity looks like, if that's what it is, that to me is vibrant Christianity, then all of my choices would aim in that direction. That's what I would go for. That is the picture I would go after in my life. And I could run across a verse that said something like this, let her be covered, or not with gold or pearls or costly array. And you can think of lots of verses you could plug in there that might, might be a stop to me and say, whoa, wait a minute. But you know, the reality is, it probably won't make me stop. I'll find a way, because in my mind, the good life, the, the a picture of Christianity is contained there. We are extremely creative in circumventing anything that gets between me and my telos. Whatever that picture in my mind is of godliness, whatever that picture is of vibrant Christianity, whatever that picture is of whatever, if that's the picture of the good life in my mind, I will find a way to get that. We are extremely creative in doing that. And the oftener we do it, the oftener we circumvent whatever verse that is, whatever counsel we have, the easier it is. Telos trumps clear biblical warnings. We're very creative even bypassing biblical warnings. We can read the Bible and find a warning that directly attacks my path, and I'll find a way around it. Let me give you an example. If I believe that production and wealth are, are really a part of the good life, I, I need to have a lot of money, I need to have production, like I mentioned earlier, if I really believe that and that's the picture I have out there, then that's what I'm going to pursue. That's what I'm going to go after because that's what's in my heart. Even the words of Jesus won't stop me here. I can come across a verse that says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, or but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now, if I had never heard of this teaching of Jesus, uh, that would definitely stop me. It, it would surely stop. Those are pretty, pretty sound words. But if my picture actually is the good life is over here with money and production. I'll find a way to get there. Eventually, those verses are not even a speed bump for me. I'll just go right through them, hardly even read them, because I'm pursuing the good life. What about this one? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. As long as accumulated wealth is part of my picture of the good life, I'll get there. I'll find a way to do it. Or production, business, schedules, timelines, just busyness, all of that. Again, it can become our telos. It's as a man, that's what I'm after. I want production. And I can read a verse that says this, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness 
of riches and the lust of other things choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Again, it's a, it's a warning against the very thing I'm doing. But regardless, I will find a way around this. Now, all this I just said, we see it so easily in the lives of others. It obviously applies to them. We can see people who are wealthier than we are. We can see people who are more productive-oriented than we are. We can see people who are uh, more fashion-oriented than we are. We can find people that are... All those things, that obviously applies to them. But when it comes to my own life, it's different. It just seems a little different to me. We are very, very creative. And the fact is that no wall is too high to keep me from finding a way to get to that good life, that tell us that I'm after. Now... When Jesus came, <clears throat> you know, he didn't come with a, a lot of rules. He did come at something, with something else. He took direct aim at our telos. He took direct aim at what we view as the good life. And following Jesus requires a change in this telos. It requires a change in what we perceive to be the good life. In fact, following Jesus equals a renunciation of loves. It requires a new telos. So back up for just a minute and ask yourself, when you think about Christianity, what is Christianity in your mind? What is that? How would you define Christianity? Is it agreeing to certain doctrinal concepts or beliefs? Is that what Christianity is? Now, it includes that. But I don't propose it's much more than that. It's much greater than that. Is it living differently? Is it a change in focus? Is it obedience to Jesus? Now, all of us believe that. We believe it changes all of that. We believe that authentic Christianity does require obedience to Jesus. But I want to propose it's much greater than that. It's much greater than just obedience to what he said or beliefs or head knowledge. It's greater than that. It actually impacts our loves. It impacts that telos within that picture of the good life. <clears throat> Jesus took direct aim at this in his teaching. Consider for just a little bit the message that Jesus delivered. He that loves father or mother more than me, or he that loves son or daughter more, cannot be my disciple. You know, in the first century, there was nothing of greater value than family. That was the highest love. And that's why Jesus took direct aim at that. Genealogy was and still is in the Middle East of high value. Whose, whose son is who and all this is, is, is extremely important. But Jesus said, I'm going to shoot in higher than that. <coughs> Try it again. So when, when Jesus aimed at your family and said, if you don't love me more than your family, he was aiming at the center core, the center love of their lives. But he didn't stop there. That which is highly esteemed among men. He took aim also at the world's value system. Do you find yourself impacted by the world's value system? You know, I do. I was a building contractor for years. And here, it's been several years ago, I, was, I saw an article called... Uh, a hundred million dollar homes, and and I was intrigued. A hundred million dollar homes. What would a? How could you spend a hundred million dollars on a home? And so I started reading this article about about a hundred million dollar homes, and about halfway through, I stopped and thought, Why am I even interested in this? Why am I so intrigued with something that we all know in a hundred years is going to be gone? It's worthless. And the fact is, I am impacted by the loves that our world has. I'm impacted by the fact that someone would spend $100 million on a home, and that tends to intrigue me. It pulls me in. But Jesus said, if you are esteeming things that the world esteems valuable, simply because they're saying it's valuable, that's an abomination to me. We are impacted by that. All of us struggle in different ways with this one, but Jesus wasn't finished. He said this, he that loves his life, his own life, shall lose it. Again, that's aiming at that center core of our loves, what we actually love. 
love of self, love of reputation, self-protection. Do any of us struggle with that one? Well, all of us struggle with that one. All of us struggle with protecting self. And yet Jesus was saying, if you don't love me more than that, you can't be my disciple. And just in case he missed anything else, he had this one. Whosoever forsakes not all that he hath. In other words, that's everything. He's saying, unless I am that center core, unless I am that telos, you can't be my disciple. Jesus was calling for a renunciation of all these other loves. He wants actually to be that center, that core in our lives, that picture of the good life. And this means that following Jesus means renouncing our other old telos. Now, from the very beginning, Jesus called for repentance. It's repentance is simply renouncing the old and embracing the new. It's turning from and turning toward. And many vows in older church traditions embrace this thought. Uh, a public renouncement of the old telos, the old loves, and turning toward something else. I just pulled out one. I pulled one from the Anglican Church. Uh, it's, a, it's a vow that's asked by the Anglican Church. I want just listen to this question. Do you renounce the devil and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Re begins with a renunciation of Satan himself. Question, do you renounce the empty promises and deadly deceits of this world that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? It's a renunciation of the world's value system, that which is highly esteemed, giving up that, that which the world says is of great value. It's a huge part of telos. And finally, do you renounce the sinful desires of the flesh that draw you from the love of God? That's a forsaking of everything. Notice in historical, many churches have this. There's an acknowledgement that Christianity actually is a renunciation of the old and a turning to the new. Now, many churches may not follow that, and all of us struggle to, but I just wanted to point to the fact that at its core, Christianity has always said this. It's always said it's a renunciation. Followers of Jesus embrace a new telos. And in many ways, baptism is a renouncing of that. It's an it's a actual outward manifestation of renouncing the old telos and embracing and committing to the new. It's a new telos focusing on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ being our new focus, being our new telos, being what everything is aimed at. And so, consequently, our lives will look like this, our extra time, a man who is converted, who is transformed, his extra time is going to be going toward the kingdom of God. His extra money is going to be going that direction. His ability to be going that direction. His thoughts, his prayers, his loves, his strongest longings are all aimed toward the kingdom of God. It's a change of focus. It's aimed at the advancement of the kingdom of God. And the result is, is ultimate success to this man is glorifying God and advancing his kingdom. That's what's going to come out of his life. It's going to be more exciting to him than business success, than profits, than personal gain, than personal reputation. It's going to be more important than his family, is, as important as that is. It's going to be more important than that. It's going to be more important than chasing fads and fashions and all the things out there the world is giving you. It's more important than that. Everything is now pointed in that direction in his life. I want you to notice how Paul describes this telos. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, notice not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. He's saying Everything, even little mundane things like eating and drinking, are to be pointed in that direction. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Imagine that. Every activity in your life is aimed in that direction. And the goal, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Not that my own personal desires are fulfilled, but that unbelievers can be saved, that the gospel can advance that others can see his beauty, that it can pull them and compel them to walk with him. 
We are workers together with God now as transformed believers, followers of Jesus. We are going after the things that he is going after. Our lives are going to be poured into people, not into things, fulfilling his purposes. This is a passage that describes God's purpose. God really has two purposes in this world. One is to glorify his name and the other is to reconcile men to himself. And everything we do will fall under that label when we're fully transformed and following him. Following Jesus by definition requires a new telos. And so one question you can ask yourself is, has my telos, has my picture of the good life actually been transformed? Is it actually different than my neighbor's? Or does it look real similar? You know, when that happens, our businesses become missions. Our life changes. Everything we do now is intended to reflect his glory and advance his kingdom. Now, I want to walk through a challenge that we tend to experience, I'll say, in the Anabaptist churches. It's actually true in every denomination. But it has to do with maintaining a Jesus-centered telos while preserving a multi-generational culture. Now, if you remember with me in the book of Acts, at the end of the second chapter, at the end of the fourth chapter, there is a picture of what the church looked like. It was a beautiful picture. It talks about a group of people that are committed to each other, who are excited about life, who forgot all about their old telos, who are all they care about now is advancing the kingdom. They're going out preaching the gospel. It's an exciting, exciting time. And the only pressure, the only conflict they're facing is external. Nothing from within. But you don't get very far in the book of Acts. You get to the fifth chapter and you read about Ananias and Sapphira. Suddenly there's a problem from within the church. You get to the sixth chapter and you have widows grumbling and and there's kind of conflict here and things aren't going very well. And so they start looking back and trying to figure out how how do we deal with this? And I suspect they look back into history, maybe at, at Moses and Jethro and delegation here, and so have some delegation and make all this work. And, and then later on in the book of Acts, you go from just excitement in the beginning to looking back in history, and then you start to hear a phrase called the way. And I think it's six times in the book of Acts, Christianity is referred to as the way. In fact, it became, I would say, a culture. It became a way of doing life. And then later on, in, in, the Old, in the New Testament, you read Paul warning people not to forget the simplicity that's in Christ. You get to the church of Ephesus, and Jesus says, you've left your first love. Now, I want to visually put that on the screen if I can, and think about, because it's a pattern that has went on through church history and still impacts us today. Christianity always starts, first generation always starts with a radical love for Jesus. There's an obedience to Jesus, forsaking all for the community, reliance on the Holy Spirit, and an active love for the lost and hurting. Total surrender. I see this today in, in, uh, when I go into Muslim countries. I see churches just starting out. There's a passion. There is a love for God. Uh, nothing gets in the way of that. Usually very little thought even about family life. It's all about, it's all about advancing the kingdom. There's her being in China one time, working with, uh, with pastors there, And they weren't even thinking about their children. They were so excited about going out and sharing the gospel, that's all they could think about. But the fact is, as a church ages, there's usually some conflict, and we tend to go back and learn from the past. There's Old and New Testament. uh, There's church history. I call it historic pragmatism, finding out what worked in the past. So we had this initial excitement. Now there's some church ages. We get some conflict. And now we start thinking about how do we respond to the conflict we're having. Over time, this turns into a culture. And you give it enough time, it becomes a strong culture. And the emphasis now is submission to the group. Uh, Time-honored traditions. There's songs we sing. There's the, the, the words we're reading. There's the practices we do. There's group distinctives within that. All that becomes a culture. And then finally, somebody rises up and says, wait a minute, we've left our first love. We we were back there excited about serving Jesus, and now we've got this culture. And many times in this 
movement right here. If I can get my... In this section right here, when you try to go from a strong culture and return back, there's almost always a loss. Because when you start messing with a culture, it's hard to know now what do you keep and what do you pitch, and there's confusion. But that has went on repeatedly through history. But I want to say this. I drew this as a three-legged stool because the reality is if you want a multi-generational church, you actually need a strong culture. Strong cultures are essential in, in business life. They're essential. It's not just Christianity. You can look at Judaism. You can look at, at Islam. The groups with the strongest culture, the most radical Islam, are actually the ones that keep their children the best. Same is true in Judaism. The stronger the culture, the more you have a multi-generational group. That's true in business as well. The problem is we're not wanting just multi-generational. We're also wanting this to be Jesus-centered. We're actually wanting to be focused on him. And so just an observation, I want you to think about this, that our challenge has always been to keep that initial focus on Jesus while also maintaining a strong culture. There's always a tension between those two. Now, these three legs on this stool, I believe, are all essential if you want a multi-generational church that honors Jesus. They're not equal, but they're all essential. They're all very important. And one more thought here is in the final judgment, you don't find anyone that I've read in the New Testament being judged on culture. It's actually this section right here. Were you actually being Jesus to others? Were you actually living out? Were you caring for the poor? Were you doing that? And it's very possible to develop this strong culture over here and actually lose this inner telos, this inner picture of what the good life is. And you can think about multiple places. You can go to the rich young ruler, uh, Matthew 25, where, where people come before God in judgment. You can think about rich man and Lazarus. It's always, were you being Jesus to people around you? That's the judgment. And yet to maintain that over time does take a strong culture. And that is our challenge. And our telos, I'm, I'm proposing today, has to actually include all three of these. If you're going to have multi-generational churches that actually do follow Jesus. What do I esteem to be the good life? I want to conclude with this. In your own life, what is it? What is that picture within? You know, this isn't always easy to determine in our own lives. Sometimes it's good to ask others. It's good to have a strong brotherhood, others to speak into our lives. Partly because our hearts are extremely, extremely deceptive. We tend to justify ourselves. We tend to see what we want to see. And it's essential that we have and allow other believers to speak into our lives Give them permission to do that, to challenge us, to call us back. Because our tendency is to justify ourselves. It's also important that we look further than just good intentions. Analyze external reference points. If you're serious about knowing what your telos is, what the good life is in your heart, ask yourself some questions. I want to walk through just a few questions to ask yourself to help you determine what is the good life to me? What does that mean to me? Where do my thoughts go in the face of a crisis? If you imagine an economic crisis happening, where does your mind go immediately? Does it go to um, your bank account? Does it go to your net worth? Does it go to your insurance policy? Does it go to God? Where does your mind go when you're facing a crisis? It will tell you something about what you're relying on. One of the dangers of affluence is our focus tends to shift over time. This can help us determine what it is we're actually depending on. What do I enjoy talking about? Have you ever noticed if you get a group of uh, deer hunters together in America, what you talk about? Or pilots, people who fly planes, or whatever, whatever the hobby is, we are most comfortable talking about things we're very familiar with. Something that we enjoy talking about means our heart has been there. It's going to tell a lot about what's inside your heart, what you enjoy talking about. It can reveal your inner loves. Where do my discretionary resources flow? It's been said before that your, your checkbook is a theological document. 
Where your money goes will tell you a lot about your inner loves. It will tell you that. What is your definition of success? Is my definition of success different than my neighbor's? Do I really love the souls of men and the advancement of the kingdom more than my business? Do I actually believe Jesus' way is better? When you read Matthew 5, 6, 7, you read Luke 6, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, do you see those as obstacles to keep you from the good life? Or do you see those verses as the path to the good life? Where do you, how do you read those? Are they the difficult, the hard sayings of Jesus? Is that how we read them? Or do we actually see them as a blueprint on how to enjoy the good life? Has my telos really been transformed? And that is the real and I'll say final question I want to leave you with. Has your telos, has that picture from within actually been transformed? Is, trans, is telos transformation a reality in my life? Is that actually happened? Paul addresses this question in his letter to the Romans. He says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's saying transformation is to be occurring. We don't just naturally all of a sudden wake up some morning and our telos has been changed. That doesn't happen very often. God is at work. We could call this simply the transformation of our telos, that renewing of our mind, that changing of our mind. So the question I want to leave you with as we conclude here is simply this. Is the kingdom of God, is the advancement of his kingdom your telos? Is it actually the picture you have of the good life? You know, Jesus asked a profound question. I woke up last night about two in the morning thinking about this question. Jesus said this, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Why do we do that? Why do we call him Lord? You know what we're saying? We're saying outwardly that my telos is the kingdom of God. It's loving him. But actually, he's saying internally it's not. That's not what it is. So I want to ask you this morning, are you using the influence you have, whatever your position, whether you are a father, mother, whether you're a church leader, whether you work on the job, are you using your daily interaction to help shape, to help encourage, to help motivate others toward a God, Christ-centered telos? That's the goal that I have for my life. I'm not always there. I look in my life sometimes at, at my actions, my responses. I can see there's a long way to go yet. God's still working there. And that's my encouragement to you today is allow God to keep shaping, keep changing that telos, that picture you have of the good life.